And good morning, Ridge Point Church. Let's try it again. How are you doing now? Yeah, much better. Listen, yeah, go, you clap, whatever you want to do. I, I love it. I love the energy last several weeks. We are super glad that you're here this morning. We have a lot of stuff. Obviously, we're starting to share schools hitting. We had a chance to be back at Auburndale High School earlier this week. And, and it seems like once that school calendar starts to hit, life starts to pick back up. And we have a lot of stuff to share in the coming weeks of some stuff that's taking place. But one of the things is as we start to roll into that year is, is to continue the energy. A lot of times over the summer, we kind of get chill and the schedule kind of lays back a little bit. And we hit school year, we hit school year running. But there's been a lot of energy this summer. We want to maintain that once we start to head into the fall and what that looks like for us, you'll hear more about in the, in the next several weeks. Speaking of which, one of the big things, we're going to give a talk on this in a few weeks, but one of the big things uh, that we're looking forward to as, as the kind of starts to, to unwind here is that for us, discipleship happens best in what we call circles. When we get together, it's, it's awesome to be in, in rows like this and be able to talk, but at this point, uh, there's a lot of people listening and one person talking, and we've learned that it's easier to engage Uh, when everyone's talking together. So we do Sunday mornings, which we love, which we pour a lot of energy and passion into. But we also do something that we call groups during the week, RPC groups. And they happen in different people's homes. And it gives us a chance to to not just uh, sit there and listen, but be engaged and have conversation and and to eat meals together and get to know some different people. And along those lines, we're getting ready to gear up for, for groups launching in the fall. And we need some more host homes. Uh, So if you're interested in finding out what that looks like, it just is a place for people to come and you pop a DVD in or you watch a a, a streaming uh, video session and talk about it a little bit. If you're interested in finding out what that looks like, because we want to increase our capacity this year in every area that we have a chance to serve. And one of the ways we do that, one of the big ways we do that is through groups. And so if you're interested at all in being a group host, we have a meeting next Sunday right after the service. It's a short meeting. Uh, by signing up, you're not saying, yes, I'm going to be a, a group host. It's just to saying, yes, I'm interested in finding out more information. If you would at some point, even if you want to do it right now, take out your connection card and write that on the connection card. Say, I'd love to be a part of finding out more about that. Uh, write group host, and, and Chris will get with you this week. And we'll have that meeting next Sunday after church to let everyone know, hey, here's what this is going to look like in the fall. And we want to be able to increase our capacity because that's what we believe that we're supposed to be doing. So maybe you've never been in a group before, and you say, man, I'd love to be a part of it. That's really cool if you want to be a host. If not, if you want to sign up, that's coming. Uh, But maybe you've been in a group for a while, and you say, it's time for us to multiply, and I want to open up my home to be able to have one of those studies. Group host meeting next Sunday, immediately following the service. Now, we've been in the middle of this series, wrapping up this morning, a series looking at an incredible vision. Uh, as, as we look at the book of Nehemiah, if you've been here the last several weeks, uh, you, you know this, but if not, we're going to do a little bit of review. But, but the book of Nehemiah is, is written by, about a guy who was waiting for his one moment. Like he was waiting for, uh, trying to figure out, God, what is the one thing I'm supposed to do? And when that vision is revealed to him, when, it becomes, when he becomes aware, this is what I'm supposed to do, the vision at first seems impossible. I don't know if you've ever been there before or not, but when when God starts to reveal something to us, when he starts to speak to us, and we look at the task, and we say, there is no way in the world I could accomplish that task, because I just look at the amount of resources, the amount of finances, the amount of people, all of the things that it would take, and just the amount of things would have to fall into place for this to happen. Like, it seems insurmountable. Nehemiah gets one of those type visions. He hears from some family members about the disrepair of, of, of his homeland, of, of what Jerusalem was, was like. He heard about the shame among the people. He heard about the, the falling down of the walls and the gates. And, and, he, and he said, this, this has driven me to the point of, of tears. And, and I'm on my knees fasting and praying before God, saying, I believe this is the very thing that I've been called to do. This is, this is the one thing. And so if you go back to week one, we start talking about, okay, what does that look like for us? And so in week one of this series called Distractions, we said this, uh, and we're trying to discover God's plan for our lives. We said this, distractions deter us from the plan and purpose of God for our lives. That ultimately these distractions that are there, God has a plan and purpose for our lives, and the distractions that happen in our lives deter us from that plan and purpose, whatever that looks like. It can be good distractions. Good distractions can get in the way of what is great. So distractions deter us. We said if we're going to figure out what God's plan and purpose is, we have to ask some powerful questions. 
The first question, if I'm trying to figure out God's plan for my life in a specific area, the first question I have to ask is, what has God already said on that subject? What has God already spoken about? What has God already said on that subject? If I'm trying to figure out God's plan, I can, I can start off here and say, God, if I'm trying to figure out a plan and you've already revealed it to me, then I don't have to go any further than that. Uh, but if it's not very clear from Scripture, because it gives us some general principles, that might not be immediately uh, very specifically applicable to where we're at in life. But we begin with that question, what has God already said on the subject? Uh, the second question we look at is, what is it that keeps us up at night? What is it, and, and I'm not talking about our, our kids who don't let us sleep. But I'm talking about, like, what are the, the big issues that I say, man, God, I want to build up your kingdom, and I think that if we could ever do this as, as believers, maybe nationwide, or if we could do this as believers, even worldwide, I'm talking about big-time stuff, what is it that keeps me up at night? Because often God will use those things, our passions, to guide where he's speaking to us and what he's speaking to us about. And the third question is this, what can only I do? Not what can everybody else do, but what is my role? Nehemiah, as he starts to pray about it, he prays a very specific prayer saying, God, I believe that this is something that's supposed to take place, but I also believe that you have strategically put me in position to be able to do this. See, God believe this right now, that God is strategically putting people in position to accomplish some extraordinary things. That God is constantly at work in our lives saying, I want to strategically put you in a position to be difference makers. And we have to ask these questions. God, what have you said on this subject? What keeps me up at night? And what is the one thing? What can only I do? And once we figure out what God's uh, task is, what his, what his purpose is for us, week two, we start talking about then, once we have that, that vision, the distractions start to hit. And week two was talking about distractions initially from, from inside. Because as soon as we start to have those, those big visions, and, and we said this last week, big visions don't have to be things that change the world. They can be things as simple as, man, I want to change my family. But as soon as we start to, to, to encounter those, those big visions that God has for us, things start to hit us. Nehemiah was met early on in Nehemiah chapter 2 with, with fear. He was hit with doubt. He was hit with insecurity. And facing fear, doubt, and uncertainty on the way to do the impossible, that's what that, that week two was about. And the big idea was this. The big idea is impossible is why most people never realize their God-given vision. We look at the task. We say, man, I'd love to see this family situation resolved. I'd love for there to be peace and harmony, but that's impossible. God, I, I can never see that happening. I, I see this, this relationship is falling apart. It's impossible. That relationship could never uh, be restored. I don't think restoration is a possibility. Or it could be accomplishing something even outside of the family responsibility. And we look at that and say, man... The numbers are, are not in our favor. There's no way that could ever happen. And so we sit back and say, I'd love to see that happen. I'd love to see that happen in my lifetime. But looking at the numbers, the numbers aren't there, and it's impossible. Impossible is why most people never realize their God-given vision. Now, in the first two weeks of, of this, uh, we, we read through just the first two chapters of Nehemiah. If I flip through to the very end of Nehemiah, we discover we only gone two weeks we've gone two chapters and there's 13 chapters in nehemiah and we have one week left that gives me 11 chapters today to cover so if with your permission i'm going to go till about 2 30 this afternoon chris is bringing in communion wafers and apple juice to, <laughs> to get it I'm, I'm just kidding we're not gonna do that nehemiah is simply a, a jumping off point uh, for where we're going in this in this series and where we're going to finish up today but today we're going to transition a little bit we'll get there in just a second we're going to transition to what happens when those distractions come from outside of, of us. I think we're our main uh, conspirators. We're the main people working against ourselves. Often that doubt and insecurity works against us. And so because of that, we often the ones have to speak truth in our life instead of listening to the doubt and the fear and insecurity that we face. But sometimes those, those things come from, from outside. And so today we're going to focus on that. But before we get there, there's four central truths as, as we get ready to wrap up the series. Four central truths that I want us to discover about this, this big vision. Number one is this. Nehemiah had spent his whole life up to this point. He would spent his whole life looking for his one thing. Now he might not cognitively have been aware of that. But up until this point, although he's doing many things, Nehemiah had been looking for this one thing. 
Now, I think most of us, at least when we're younger, we want to discover what that big thing is. Most of us, maybe it's when we're in high school, we're beginning the post-high school, whether it's college or whether it's going into the workforce, we start to figure out, okay, what is it that I want to do with life? What is it that I want to accomplish? What is my purpose? Now, Nehemiah said, I've spent most of my life trying to figure out that one purpose is, and I'm, I might not be in every moment cognitively aware that I'm looking for it, but it's always in the back of my mind because I want to be aware enough that when that thing is dropped into my life, that I know, God, this is what I have been anticipating my entire life. This is it. This is what I've longed for. What if Nehemiah had gotten the report? And they said, hey, Jerusalem is in disrepair. The people are full of shame. And he said, that's, man, that's really sad. Somebody should step up and do something about that. Like, I think for most of us, that would have been our response. And, and that's fine, because that's not our calling. But for most of us, when we start to face the, the big questions, the, the big things about life, that we say, man, we need to start to tackle this thing head on. We look at that, even on, on a church level. We look at that and say, that's, that's terrible. Somebody should probably do something about that. When often God has equipped you and I to be the difference makers. And God has equipped you specifically for a very uh, specific pur pur purpose, something that you're supposed to accomplish. And so Nehemiah has been waiting his whole life for that moment. But, but, but number two is this. Discovering his one thing didn't prevent him from doing many things along the way. Discovering his one thing didn't uh, uh, prevent him from doing many things along the way. Now, I think this is a problem. Uh, it, it's not kind of ju just to millennials. It's not every millennial that deals with this. But I think this is one of those things that, that you could see uh, become kind of part of a culture if we're not careful, uh, especially among the millennial generations, that they want to accomplish. What I love about the millennial generation is they want to accomplish some amazing things. If you give them a task, if you give them a purpose, they're going to use everything within their power to accomplish it. But until they discover what that thing is, they're going to sit on the couch and play video games. Like, like that's just is it. They want to be driven to action. They want to be driven to do something. And, and we can look at other generations and say, well, that's true of them. But it's also true of us. Before we point our finger at any specific generation, we say, well, what about us? Like, yeah, we want that big purpose. We want that big thing to attack. But what are the things that we're doing right now? Nehemiah, though he is waiting for that one thing, he's still busy doing other things. Some probably by his own volition, some because he's forced into certain situations. But here he's the cupbearer of the king. He has a high level of responsibility. Now, it's not, it's not necessarily a very uh, hard job. It's challenging that he could die because of his job. It's not a very difficult job. But he also knew this. Number three, those many things were preparing him for his one thing moment. You see, if we're looking for our one thing, we realize that all those menial tasks along the way are preparing us for our one big thing moment. This is going to date some of us real quick, but how many remember the original Karate Kid? Yeah, how many of y'all saw it like back on Netflix or something? <laughs> You've at least seen the original Karate Kid. I, I think I saw something that it's been out like 25 years or something like that now. Like it's an incredibly, it's an incredible thing it's been that long. But, but if you remember early on in the Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi is, is taking Daniel's son as, as his protege and, and to kind of teach him and, and all those things. And he begins giving him menial tasks. He begins by saying, wax on and wax off. And he begins waxing the car and painting the fence. And, and after a while, Daniel at first is okay. He's like, okay, I'll do those things. I'll do those things. But eventually he gets frustrated. He doesn't understand. Mr. Miyagi, you've given me all these menial tasks, and they're all for naught. Like, all I'm doing is waxing your car and painting your fence. And, and why are you having me all? I'm, I'm just your, 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 your slave. I'm just kind of doing whatever you want me to do. And, and then Mr. Miyagi finally starts revealing to him, no, all of those things that I'm doing, I'm teaching you coordination. I'm teaching you strength in those areas. And all those things are being led to make you better at what you're supposed to do. Nehemiah realized that because of the things that he was doing in his life, they're preparing him for his, his one moment. He was around successful people. He got to see, man, this is how you organize things, and, and this is how the king works, and this is, this is what leadership looks like. 
He was around the visual image of saying, man, I'm around people on, on a daily basis that get to accomplish big things. Even though it doesn't seem like my part is, is a whole lot right now, I'm being able to observe all of this so that when God calls on me, I am ready. And not only has he equipped me to be around the right people, but he also has allowed me to have some key people who I can now lean on. Because ultimately, the people we surround ourselves with are going to be a big determiner of the success that we have in life. And he says, I can now go to the king. I have a relationship now with the king where I can start to use that equity to say, I want to make a difference. Will you help me out in this endeavor? Those many things were preparing him for his one thing moment. Number four, last one. Once his one thing was discovered, those many things couldn't be a distraction. Once he figured that out, he goes to the king and says, King, uh, he takes months of planning, gets it all together, and he says, King, I'm not asking you for many things, but the first thing I'm asking for is, is free me up from my responsibility that I can go do this. We have many things, but once we figure out what that one thing is, we're supposed to be focusing on. And whether it's the big thing we focus on for life or whether it's the big thing we focus on right now, we want to make sure it's the many things they don't become a distraction. Because ultimately, when we start to focus on the one thing, we move out of what is safe. See, Nehemiah could have looked at this and he could have said, well, that's a, that's a big mission. And I can plan, I can draw it out on paper and, and I get really excited about that. But once I step out, once I start to verbalize that, once I start to share this with the king, I get really nervous about that. I'd rather play it safe and let all these many things that are really safe in my life right now, let all these many things distract me from the one big thing that allows me to be uncomfortable. And Nehemiah says, no, this is my plan. This is my purpose. I'm going to set out to do this. I'm not going to listen to fear. I'm not going to listen to doubt. I'm not going to listen to insecurity in my life. But it's time for me to set out, and I'm not going to allow those inside distractions to affect me. And as soon as he does it, he launches out, he shares the vision. And as in the midst of that, we see a foreshadow of what's going to come from the outside distractions in Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 10. So if you have your Bibles open up to Nehemiah chapter 2, we're going to go through a lot of scripture this morning. Uh, we're going to go through it fairly quickly as we kind of finish up the story, but also talk about the distractions Nehemiah was facing from outside. Uh, a little foreshadow of what's going to come. We're going to be introduced to some people I mentioned last week. But in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, it says this. But, this is when Nehemiah is kind of inspecting the walls and, and getting ready for the build. He says this, but in verse 10, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, so remember those two names, Sanballat and Tobiah, when they heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So Sanblat and Tobiah start to see what Nehemiah is about. And we see in verse 10, they say, I don't, I don't like this. And they're going to be, make it their mission to work against Nehemiah. Listen, just in case, because for every one of us, we're, we often like to see ourselves in the role of, of the good guy in the story. We want to be the Nehemiah. We want to know what our vision is. We want to work towards that vision. But just in case, because sometimes if we're honest with ourselves, we could find ourselves being the critic in the story as well. Just in case we ever get there, if we ever get to a spot where we spend more time criticizing the dreams of other people than we do carrying out our own dreams, we're probably in a bad spot. Sanblat and Tobiah aren't busy doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. Instead, they hear about what Nehemiah is doing, and they say, I, I don't necessarily like that. It displeased them greatly that he's doing that. Skip down to verse 19 of chapter 2, and it says this. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So right away, early on in the story, Nehemiah starts to get to work, and there are these two or, or three individuals who start to become critics of him, and they start to jeer at him. And eventually we're going to see they actually get to a point of making fun of him and, and the workers. And they say, what is this thing that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And these critics start to play a more uh, crucial role in the story, picking up, flip over to Nehemiah chapter 4. And we'll pick up here, we'll pick up the story in this section titled Opposition to the Work. Distraction came from outside in four different ways. First, it came in, in mockery and making fun of the Nehemiah and the workers. Watch this. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 says this. 
But when Sanballat heard what they were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. So up until this point, it was all kind of a theory, but now he walks up and he says, man, they're at, like all this stuff, we tried to make fun of them, they're still working. And he says he's angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. He came to the workers, he started to, to, to make fun of them, and he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they resort for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? He says, listen, even all the, the equipment they have, all the material they have, it's, it's, all, it's, it's dilapidated, it's not worked. Even the stones they're building have been burned. Like this isn't going to be successful. And then Tobiah has to pipe in. Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. So they're sitting here saying, this, this, all this material, it's not even good, and look at the work they're doing. And, and, and Tobiah pipes in and says, this is how weak that wall is. If even a little fox went against the wall, the wall would break down. Now they're trying to build a mighty wall that would withstand enemies that might attack them. And Tobiah's coming saying, even a fox could knock down this wall. Now I don't know about you, but this reminds me of like the kindergarten bully who wants to come in and make you feel lesser about yourselves. Like, they come with, with very superficial stuff saying, hey, let's go, let's jeer to people, let's make fun of them, because we believe if, if we make fun of them long enough that eventually they'll feel so down upon themselves that they'll just stop the work. Let's go about, literally what they're doing is they're bullying the Jews, they're bullying the leaders, saying if we make fun of them enough, the fear in their life, the doubt in their life, the insecurity in their life will take over and they're never going to finish the wall. And so they really resort back to what, what bullies learn in kindergarten can be successful. Let's make fun of them. Let's mock them. And if enough people get on our side and start to jeer and make fun of them, the building is going to stop. Good thing for most of us, we get to second, third, or fourth grade, we realize that that's not healthy, it's not good. I realize there are still bullies past that, for, but for most of us, we realize, man, instead of being on the outside and making fun of people and trying to stop people from, from moving forward, we want to support them and work towards the greater good. Santa Black Divide never learned that, that lesson. And so they set out saying, let's start to, to try to tear these people down from outside. Let's mock them. Let's make fun of them. Verse 4 says this, Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads. This is their response to uh, these people who are taunting them. And give them up to be plundered in the land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt, and let not their sin be blotted out from their sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of all the builders. In verse 6 it says this, So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height. For the people who had a mind... To work, Even with these outsiders coming in and making fun of them, Nehemiah said, we kept doing it. We kept building the wall because the people weren't going to listen to the naysayers. They weren't going to listen to the critics anymore. Even though those jeers were coming, even though that bullying was coming, they said, we're not going to listen to the critics any longer. Then it says, verse 7, But when Sambalat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard they were repairing the walls of Jerusalem, was going forward, and the preachers were being beginning to be closed, they were very angry. So they tried to stop them. It didn't work. The work resumed. Skip down to verse 15. It says this. When our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half my servants worked on construction, and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leader stood behind, behind the whole house of Judah. So he said, from that point on, we realized attacks were going to come from outside. And as long as those attacks came from outside, we needed half the people now. Before, everybody was in on construction. But now we realize that we're starting to have success. Now we realize that all of the critics are starting to take uh, notice of, of what's happening. The walls are going up. They've not been able to stop us. And we believe an attack is going to come. And because we believe that attack is going to come, we're now making sure that half of our people are working on building up the, the wall. And the other half are working on defending our back. And so they set out and said, we want to strategically put people in place where some are building and some are protecting. 
One is carrying a trowel to build up, and another is carrying a sword to defend. They said, we want to make sure that we have both sides covered. We continue to build while we continue to be defended. In our life, we have to make sure when God gives us that God-sized vision, the attacks are going to come from outside. We can get so busy defending ourselves against the attack that we stop building ourselves up. Or we can get so busy trying to be built up that when the attacks come, we're not prepared for it. So Nehemiah said, right now in this moment, I know what's about to take place. I know the attacks are about to come. And so let me make sure that we continue to build as we continue to defend. As we raise up people to defend us, to, to, to cover our flank, we're going to continue to build that wall because we're only halfway where we want to be. So the first attack came uh, in the form of, of mockery. Skip over to Nehemiah chapter 6, and we see the second attack. Once they're started to have success, we have these same enemies out there, Sanballat and Tobiah, and they don't like it. But they realize up until now, everything that we've tried has been unsuccessful. So let's go, let's try a new tactic. The second tactic we see, the second challenge we have from outside is that of other opportunities. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I'd built the wall, there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together at Hakarathim in the plain of Ono. So they said, Listen, we know that you've built up the wall. Hey, come on, let's, let's meet us, over, let, let's have a meeting together. Now, now in reality, we're going to read the latter part of this verse, and, and Nehemiah sees through this. It's a thinly veiled attempt to, to get him away from, from the work, but he says, B before that, imagine for a second that you have enemies that are working against you saying, there's no way you're going to be successful. There's no way if a fox came up against, against that wall, the wall would fall down, and all of a sudden the whole thing starts to come together. And then that enemy from outside says, hey, listen, we've heard that you built the wall up. Let's have a meeting. Let's talk about it a little bit. Maybe we've allowed pride to come into our life. Maybe at that point we're sitting here thinking, well, maybe they realized they were wrong and I was right. And they want to make up. They want to make amends. Let's go shake hands. But Nehemiah saw through it. The end of verse 2 says, but they intended to do me harm. So he sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. I want you to do something with me. Look at that line right there. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. If there's nothing else you get this morning, I want you to get that statement. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Because for some of you right now, you're in the midst of, of many things in your life, but those many things are really important. Those, maybe you figured out that one thing, but for most of us, we're in a spot of life where we have, we have a few things, not just one thing, but a few things that are really important. The God says, I'm spo you're supposed to focus on these things at this moment right now. And then what happens is other opportunities come, and other opportunities in the moment can look really appealing. Like in that moment, it can be like, yeah, I mean, that sounds like a, a great opportunity for our family to be involved in. That sounds like something I'd really like to be a part of. That sounds like a great cause. See, prior to any of these distractions, we have to know what our goal is. We have to know. Maybe it's us gathering together as a family saying, what is our family's vision? Let's write down what is it we're supposed to be focusing on. And then when these opportunities come from outside that appear to be good, and many times they are good, we look at it and say, okay, those are good opportunities, but do they help me get to where we're supposed to be? Because listen to me for a second, church, there are a bunch of great opportunities out there. In fact, the world is full of great opportunities. We have to figure out the ones that we're supposed to be partnered with. Maybe as, as a family, you've set out and said, here are our goals this year. And you set out to accomplish those goals, and, and, and all of a sudden there's an invitation to join this group, or, or your child is asked to be part of this team, or, uh, and all these things, they seem like really good opportunities. And we say, man, as, as a parent, I've been asked to, to join this organization, or, or my homeowners association has asked me to join in, and that seems like a great thing to be a part of. And all of a sudden, all these tasks can steer us away from the one thing we're supposed to be focused on. They can all be good things, but they distract us from what is great. As a church, we're cognitively aware of this. There are a bunch of great causes out there. 
In fact, there isn't a month that goes by that one or, pe- one or two people don't come by and say, hey, I got this great cause we want you to be a part of. I have this great opportunity for you to serve in the community, and, and there are a bunch of opportunities that are out there. And in those moments, one of the hardest things when we start to gather a vision, one of the hardest things to do is to say no. Because as parents, if we say no to certain opportunities, we say, well, does that make me a, a bad parent? And as a church, you're like, man, does that mean we don't care about our community because we said no to this organization? And no, we have to be focused on what the task at hand is. What is it that God has called us to do? And when those opportunities come along, they seem really appealing in the moment. Because feelings get in the way of facts. And they seem really appealing at the moment. We have to look at them and say this. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. For a mother who's saying, I want to make sure that I'm staying home with my kids, she wants to respond with all those opportunities that come. She wants to respond and say, I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. For the dad who gets called away, and he says, I got to do this, I got to do that, is saying, I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. When we get called away from our central mission, whatever that is, our response has to be, it's a great cause. It's a great opportunity. But that opportunity is getting in the way of what God has called me to do. And so I want us to do this together for a second. I want us to say those words. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Ready? I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Now say it with conviction this time. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. The first time I ever remember hearing this, the depth of this story, I was reading this incredible book called Visioneering by Andy Stanley. And I'm reading this book, and it gets to this part of the story. And in the book that I'm reading, Andy Stanley writes this phrase that I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. And I was actually, I was, I was actually at a, a previous church. I was upstairs in my office at, at our prior church, and, and I'm reading this book, and, and, and I read that line. And Andy Stanley says in the midst of his book, he says, I want you to say that line out loud right now. And I'm in my office all by myself, no one around me. My first thought was, well, I'll say it in my head. Because no one else is going to hear me, does it really matter? And if someone does hear me, they're going to walk by and say, JJ's crazy, he's talking himself in there. But I said, no, I want to be resolute in this. So I read it, said, I want you to say it. So I said, okay, I'm going to do this. I looked around, everybody watching. I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. And read a little bit further in the book, he says, okay, now I want you to say it again, only louder. I thought, am I really going to do this right now? But at some point, if we're determined to do what we're supposed to do, our response is to say it louder. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. It's not that I will not come down, it's that I cannot come down. This is a moral imperative. This is God, I finally figured out, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And as long as I have that determined in my mind, I'm not going to let distractions get in my way. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. As followers of Jesus, we have to figure out what that thing is. And we have to be willing to abandon what is great, to do things that are greater. And that's so hard because we have a lot of good causes we can be a part of. We have a lot of things we could focus on. We have a lot of missions we could be a part of. But we have to figure out, we have to abandon what is great, or we have to be willing to abandon what is great to accomplish that which is greater. Distraction came from from those things, from from opportunities. Distraction came from mockery or bullying. Distraction also comes in the form of, of criticism. We read on a little bit. We didn't get to verse 4, but verse 4 says this. And they sent me four times this way, and I answered in the same manner. So four different times they came and said, hey, we want to meet with you. And four times Nehemiah said, thanks, but no, thanks. I'm doing great work. I cannot come down. Then verse 5 says this. In the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent a servant to me with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, watch this, because this is important. In verse 5, it says the servant is, is sent with this open letter. Now, that's important to know. We might have missed that. might have glossed over that. That is important to know because back then, they would send letters with seals on them. 
Because often they'd be carried by different individuals, so they'd leave a seal. So if that seal was broken, you know other people had had a chance to, to read that letter. So almost every time, a letter sent with a seal. But this time, on purpose, Sandblatt sends the letter, says it's an open letter, meaning there's no seal on it, meaning that every hand that possessed it, if, if you're given a letter to deliver, and the letter's in a sealed envelope, you're not going to open it up, you're not going to read it. Because then the person who's receiving that will know, wait a minute, the person who delivered that had read my letter. But if someone sends you a letter, and that letter is just put in your hand, it's not even folded, it's just placed in your hand, the temptation is there to say, oh, I probably shouldn't do this, but no one ever know. And we start to read that letter. Well, Sandblad on purpose leaves that temptation there. So he sends the open letter, and it says this in verse 6. It's reported among the nations, and in Geshem also says that, that you and the Jews intend to rebel that is why you're building the wall, and according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear of these reports, so now come and let us take counsel together. So he says, listen, he sends this letter full of lies, but he says, I'm going to put this out in the form of criticism that we're going to spread rumors about them now. And these rumors are going to say that Nehemiah is doing all this work because he wants to become king. And now everybody that opens up that letter because it's not sealed is going to read that. And so Nehemiah has to go and he has to combat that. It says in verse 8, Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you have said have been done, for you are inventing them of your, out of your own mind. For they all want to frighten us, thinking their hands will be dropped from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. He says, now we're getting to the work. We're going to complete this. We're not going to allow this criticism to get in our way. And finally, the last thing we got from outside was something we also had last week. The last outside challenge that comes is in the form of fear. Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 10 through 14 says this. Now I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Meh all these names, Mehetabel, who is confined to his home, he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you by night. So he gets this word, and he says, This is what I'm supposed to be. It's in the temple. This is what I'm supposed to do. But Nehemiah, being ever aware of what's taking place, says this. But I said, Should such a man as I run away? And what man such should I go into the temple and live? I will not go in. I'm not going to allow fear to rule the day. Because, verse 12, I understood and saw that God had not sent him. This person wasn't actually a prophet coming to Nehemiah. God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because, once again, Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He says, I'm not going to allow fear to get in the way. This prophet is coming saying, hey, come hide away. They're trying to kill you. But he says, I'm able to see through all these thinly veiled attempts to stop us from the work. And it's not going to stop us from the work. I'm willing to abandon what is great to accomplish that which is greater. This impossible task, this task that we said no, nobody could ever accomplish. This. We've set out, the work has done. In the midst of this, I'm helping the, the, the people out financially. We're, we're fixing the economy. We're doing all of these things. We're bringing a genuine revival to this area. People are, the shame is gone. The shame has been removed. People are getting behind the cause. I am doing a great work. I'm not going to come down. We don't have time to read all of it, but let's skip down to Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. And I want to say get this, because success will shut up your critics. When you have success, it shuts up your critics, and success will do that. And all the critics are there, all the critics are trying to attack them, but verse 15 says this. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul. In 52 days. All of this is some possible task they set out to accomplish. He got the workers to it. They got half the wall built, and they said, okay, now we need some people to defend us as well. And they continued to work. And it's something I would have thought, well, that took months, maybe years to accomplish. Nehemiah said, we accomplished a task in 52 days. And watch the response. When all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid. And they fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. 
See, all the enemy said, I don't want to see the walls being built. Because there's no way man could accomplish that. And if it happens, if the walls are built, it must mean that God is showing them favor. See, when we set out to do impossible things, and we start to have success, our success shuts up our critics. And they start to watch and say, man, I didn't think at all that was possible. Their God must be on their side. There must be something about what they're doing. Just 52 days. And it all began because at the very beginning of Nehemiah, Nehemiah saw the need that was there. And he said, this is why I've been created. As a church, we want to set out to do impossible things. It's not that we're going to pat ourselves on the back and say, good job, we're a bunch of really spiritual, very talented people, because we're not. We're normal people who can do extraordinary things if God is on our side. And so Nehemiah's prayer at the very beginning of, of this book was, O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. And the prayer of your servant who delights to fear your name his prayer is, give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of the king. God, give success to your servant today. We always want to be about being willing to abandon great things, to achieve even greater things, to reach out and do that which seems impossible. And at the end, we don't sit there and pat, our, pat ourselves on the back saying we've accomplished much. We say, God, we thank you because it's only through you that all this can be accomplished. Let's pray together. God, as we wrap up a, a short series on not being distracted from, from our life and from our vision, God, I'd be remiss if I wasn't reminded on, on a daily basis just how much grace and mercy you show us. We deserve none of this, but God, you give us so much. And so, God, whether it's people in our congregation this morning that are dealing with their many things right now, maybe they've not gotten that one thing moment, or maybe that one thing moment has already come and gone in their life. But, God, if they're dealing with, with many things, even though they might be through a few, if they're just, if it's more than one, God, I pray you give us clarity and focus to accomplish what you're calling us to do. God, for some, I believe right now, that their one thing moment in this moment right now and where they're living is they've never completely surrendered their life to you. God, they've been living out trying to be the, the good person and be the right person and be a good moral person, but, but never to, to surrender to realize, man, it took Jesus dying on a cross to give us freedom. And so God, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice this morning that has never made the decision to truly follow him, God, I pray that even right now that this would be the moment of that decision to truly surrender and to follow him. And God, for all those who've already accomplished or, or have been a part of that, that you've already saved them, God, not by anything that we've done, but because of what you've done. God, you continue to call us to do great things. And so, God, I pray that in this moment right now, we're seeking that out. We're seeking out with clarity, God, what is it that I'm supposed to do? What are the things, as the school year is beginning to hit, as we start to get back in the routine and back in the schedules, God, what are the things, what are the big rocks in my life that I'm supposed to focus on? God, allow me the, the, the clarity, allow me the focus to not be distracted from those things. Even though they appear great, allow me the willingness to abandon that which is great, to reach out towards that which is greater, the call that you have upon our lives. God, give us that clarity and focus this morning. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.